author, along with his uh, friend and colleague, Darren Achimolu, of an important new book, The Narrow Corridor, States, Societies, and the Fate of Liberty. I especially want to extend a warm welcome to the many students that we have here tonight, both from the University of Chicago and from Northwestern, continuing the Council's 100-year tradition of nonpartisanship. Um, to those of you students and who consider yourself young, I'd like to mention to you that we have a very vibrant young professionals program here at the Council. Um, it's an opportunity to come and hear speakers, to meet people who are interested in um, issues that you are interested in, to have discussions, and, um, and also have a lot of fun. So I think, is, is Brittany McGee here? I think she's, oh, there she's in the back. Brittany McGee runs the Outstanding Young Professionals Program. We have some propaganda for you in the back also. So we welcome you to come and join with the young professionals. Um, speaking of propaganda, um, I got home from work yesterday and I had 15 end of year solicitation letters in my mailbox. And if I had 15, I'm guessing some of you in this audience probably have gotten 100 this week. So I know that Everyone is making requests now as we move toward uh, Giving Tuesday. I just want to remind you of how important the Chicago Council has been for almost 100 years now, convening people to discuss issues of immense, occasionally existential importance to our country and to the world. And if you value the work that comes out of here, both as a convener, but also um, the research arm of the council, and as a voice of Chicago and Washington, I, I would just hope to encourage you to remember the council as you consider your end of year giving. Quick disclaimer, the views expressed by the individuals, tonight the individual that we host, is his own. And they do not necessarily represent the institutional positions or views of the council. Today's program is on the record and being live streamed. Please silence your phones if you have not done so already. As I said, we are on the record. We welcome your social media engagement throughout this event and afterwards. And following this discussion, we will take questions from the audience as well as from the Meeting Pulse app. And if you would like to send us a question via the Meeting Pulse app, please type ccga.live into your browser. It's now my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Professor James Robinson, the Institute Director of the Pearson Institute for the Study of Resolution and Global Conflict, excuse me, Global Conflicts, and a university professor at the University of Chicago. Uh, professor Robinson received his PhD from Yale, his master's degree from the University of Warwick, and his bachelor's degree from the London School of Economics and Political Science. He is widely recognized, along with Professor Achimolu, as the co-author of Why Nations Fail, The Origins of Power, Prosperity, and Poverty, and as I mentioned, his new book, The Narrow Corridor. The Narrow Corridor will be for sale immediately following today's pr presentation, and I understand that Professor Robinson has kindly agreed to stay and sign some copies. So without further ado, there goes a pen. Um, thank you very much, and please welcome Professor Robinson to the stage. Okay. Um, thanks very much. You can, th these slides, you can see them somewhere, can you? Ah, okay, all right, good. I thought they'd be here. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks very much for inviting me, and thank you all uh, very much for coming. I'm just going to give a very terse overview of the book, and then we'll have a discussion and questions and things like that. So, 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 oh, I keep, yes, no, yes, yes. So here it is, here's the cover. Uh, so what's, 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 what's this book about? Well, I, I guess that, you know, Daron and I, we've always been, we've been working together for about 25 years now, and we're just very, very interested in the way in which human societies differ one from the other in the incredible sort of diversity that there is in the world. And you know, you could think of that in lots of different ways. You can think of the consequences of that in lots of different ways, economic or political or whatever. And you could think about what is driving that in lots of different ways. But here's, here's so the book is about that. And here's one way of thinking about a framework for thinking about some sorts of diversity. You know, if you look around the world and you think about different societies, and I'm going to give some concrete examples in a minute, you know, one thing that varies enormously is what you might call the power of the state. So that's on the vertical axis. You know, what's the power of the state? The, the ability of the state to regulate society, 
to impose rules, to collect taxes. That's enormously different throughout the world. Okay, so think of that as being one kind of dimension of difference. And on the horizontal axis, there's a different dimension, which I'm going to call, this is a bit more elusive, but let me call it the power of society. So what, what's the power of society? We mean the ability of society to sort of act collectively and articulate collective goals and, and, and pursue them. Okay? And that differs enormously across different societies. So let me, let me just start with some very... So I'm going to start by thinking about where, where we could position some concrete examples on this, on this diagram. Okay, so start by thinking of a place, you know, we could, you know, of a place where, let's say, the state is relatively strong compared to society. So some parts of the world, the state is strong compared to society. What, what place comes to mind? North Korea, <laughs> North Korea yes. Very good. I, I'm not going to give that example, but exactly, yeah. <laughs> So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about I'm going to talk about China, but that's a, exactly that's a great example. China, Russia. Okay. So if I was going to put China on this diagram, I'd sort of say, well, the Chinese Chinese state is pretty strong. It can monitor people. It has a strong military. It's not good at doing some things, but it's pretty. And I'm going to come back to that. But it's pretty good at doing lots of things. It's good at you know persecuting people it doesn't like and locking up people. You know. Uh, so, but but you sort of say. This is, you know, this is not a place where society is very strong collectively. Okay, so so I put it on the the vertical axis there. Okay, just you know, this is going to be pretty schematic. So 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 just let's put it there. So so and one thing, you know, when we started thinking about this is, you know, the first thing you you kind of observe about China is that you might think, well, that's how things are today, but actually, that's how things have been for a very long time. In China, you know, if you go back two and a half thousand years, you know, when Confucius was writing in the Analects, Confucius observes in his kind of cryptic way, commoners do not debate matters of government. So Confucius's notion of state society relations had no concept of participation or representation or accountability. Commoners do not debate matters of government, and that's more or less how it's been for two and a half thousand years in China. One of the great kind of intellectual founders of the Qin dynasty, the first kind of unified Chinese state, was a gentleman called Shang Yang. Um, my pron Chinese pronunciation is very bad, so I apologize to people in the audience who know how to get this right. So Shang Yang was an advisor. He was one of the founders of so-called legalist philosophy. He was an advisor to the, the Duke of Qin, but about 100 years before the first dynasty started. But he was one of the kind of intellectual mentors and he developed a model of state society relations, you could say, of the balance of power between the state and the society. And it was a very stark model. Here's a quote from his writings, the existing writings that have come down to us. Uh, when the people are weak, the state is strong. Hence, the state strives to weaken the people. So that's on the vertical axis, right? When the state, he has, his idea is that, you know, this is what a properly ordered society looked like. Strong state, weak society. And in fact, you know, those two things were kind of mirror images of themselves. That, to, you know, to make the state strong, you make the people weak, okay? That's what he said. And his model of state society relations of a powerful militarized state micromanaging society is exactly what you got with the first Qin dynasty. Okay? And I would say, you know, here's a leap of faith that perhaps we could discuss. I would say that's an enormously persistent way of thinking about things in China. You know, here's a famous image from Tiananmen Square just a little over 30 years ago, uh, of the gentleman standing in front of the tank. Here's a strong society, uh, no, sorry, strong state, weak society. And if you come right the way through today in Tiananmen Square, if any of you have been there recently, uh, they're putting up 200 million, this is the number that keeps coming up in newspapers, I'm not quite sure how accurate it is, but the number that comes up is 200 million face recognition cameras are going up in China 
to monitor and control people. You know, when George Orwell wrote his famous book, when was that, 1948, it was published, he said, Big Brother is watching you. Now, in 1948, it wasn't technologically possible for Big Brother to watch you, but now it is, you know, now it is, okay? So, so that's, that's one, one society located in this diagram. But of course, if you think about the world, there's lots of other places that are not like that at all, okay? What about Yemen, for example? There's a country that's in the news a lot. If you were gonna put Yemen on that picture, or Lebanon, or many places in sub-Saharan Africa, where would you put it? Well, not like where China and Russia is. In fact, if anything, it's the other way around in Yemen. The state is extremely weak, but society is relatively organized. Okay, it's organized in a very specific way. Here's a, here's a photo from Wikipedia, so uh, it may not be completely accurate, uh, but, but it looks like Yemen. And, and these look like Yemeni gentlemen, you know, how can you tell? Well, they have a dagger, you know, they have a dagger in their belt. So when a boy is six, they get their first dagger. There's lots of different sorts of daggers and, you know, depending on the angle you hold it, that signifies lots of different things. But, but Yemen society, especially the north of Yemen, is not really organized through a state. It's organized through clans and kinship groups. It's, in a sense, society is very organized. But the state is very weak. It's organized in a particular way. And that's why, you know, uh, oh, I, I want to keep pointing at the thing, but the point is not going to be much use unless it bends. Anyway, so, so, so it, is, it, it is where it is for a, for a reason, and I'll come back to it, okay? But I just want to emphasize here, Yemen is a society where the state is very, the state is very weak, uh, and society is relatively strong. So the balance of power in that society looks extremely different than in North Korea or China or, you know, Cuba or other parts of the world, okay? Yemen is very interesting for a social scientist like me. I'm talking about states and state-society relations. You know, the most famous definition of a state in social science is due to the great German sociologist Max Weber, and here's Weber's definition made in a, a talk he gave in 1919. The state is that human community that successfully claims the monopoly of the legitimate use of violence within a given territory. So what, what distinguishes the state from other institutions or entities is that it has the legitimate monopoly of violence. But that's not true in Yemen. In Yemen, it's almost the opposite. It's society that has the legitimate use of violence. A any person has the legitimate right to use violence. That's why they all have daggers and guns, and it's uh, absolutely the opposite of what Weber uh, conceived of. But these are extreme types, you could say, and obviously I'm kind of simplifying. For those of you who read Why Nations Fail, we try to develop this dichotomy between extractive and inclusive institutions, and you know, there's lots of shades of gray and, 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 and complexity and nuance, obviously, and since I'm an academic, you know, I, I thrive on nuance, so don't tempt me. Uh, so here we're trying to keep things simple and sort of say, you know, if you think about societies in the world, there's just enormous kind of differences, but let, let's think about this balance between state and society. And here I can think about these, these are real cases with two very different balances between state and society. But obviously, you know, we're living in a country which isn't like Yemen and it's not like China either. So, you know, where would that be? Well, I guess here, all right? We'd say what distinguishes Western Europe, Northern Europe, North America from Yemen or the Central African Republic or China or North Korea is that there's much more of a balance between state and society. How long has Yemen looked like that? I emphasized a lot the kind of historical aspect of state-society relations in China. Actually, you know, we know a lot about Yemen. They have writing. Uh, following the rise of Islam in Medina, imams came, Islamic authority came. What we know about Yemen, we know at least going back a thousand years, it's pretty persistent, that organization of society. So that's also a pretty historic thing. That's not something that was created relatively recently. And I don't think 
and this is what we argue in the book, this balance between state and society, it's not easy to achieve, but it's also pretty historic in the European case. And let me just give you one little snippet of how that came about. Okay. How is it that Western Europe, for example, without getting into North America, how is it that Western Europe achieved this different balance between state and society? Well, the story, the story we tell in the book is, you know, that also goes back a long way. It goes back to the collapse of the Western Roman Empire and the spread of the German tribes throughout Western Europe. And a great political entrepreneur called King Clovis emerged. Clovis was the king of the Franks, and he took over, the Franks were a German tribe, he took over the Western uh, Roman Empire, created France, Charlemagne, etc. So he founded the Merovingian dynasty. What, what did he do? Well, what did kings do? They promulgate law court, law, law codes. He promulgated the Salic law. So here's an example, just a snippet from an existing, it's a later existing version of the Salic law. And I just want to point out something very significant about this and contrast it with Lord Shang, with Shang Yang. So here's the preface before you get into the Salic law. It says, therefore, four men chosen out of many, Wizogast, Arrogast, Saligast, and Widogast. It's a, it's a bit like Lord of the Rings, you know, I'm sure Tolkien, Tolkien must have read this, right? came from beyond the Rhine, the Franks were Germans, they came from beyond the Rhine, coming together in three legal assemblies and discussing the origins and cases carefully. So the Salic law is not at all like, we don't have the whole Qin legal code, but what we have, the fragments we have, suggests this was a kind of top-down, micromanage model of society. That's not what the Salic law is at all. The Salic law was a codification of the customs and norms of the Franks and Germanic tribes. It was a completely different beast, okay? And it wasn't composed by King Clovis. It was composed by a bunch of lawgivers who came together in three legal assemblies. So what's interesting about the Frankish state and the subsequent spread of this model throughout Western Europe is that it fused extremely participatory institutions of the Germanic tribes with late Roman state institutions, administrative institutions, bureaucratic institutions. Who wrote this thing? It's in, it's, it, the original versions are in Latin. Who? Clovis seems to have probably been illiterate. Roman lawyers who were co-opted by the Franks. So they took these centralized aspects of Roman state and merged them with these very participatory institutions. So, so if you want to know, our story about you know, how come Western Europe is up there and not at either side, it's this element of political entrepreneurship at the collapse of the Western Roman Empire that leads to this particular model of governance that spreads throughout the Carolingian Empire, it spreads to Britain with the Anglos and Saxons and... Um, all right, so, so, so now I put some... Now you know where the title of the book comes from. Okay, and I put some arrows on to suggest, you know, historical dynamics. The idea of the book and the notion of a narrow corridor is, you know, is that think about the consequences of these different types of state society balance. Okay, the title in the book we have the t we have the word liberty. Okay, so let me back up a little and talk about, you know, now I gave you the flavour of the argument. If I talk about liberty, and you think about the nature of liberty in these different societies, you can see there's a big difference. Okay, what do I mean by liberty? I just mean, you know, liberty in the sense of John Locke or John Stuart Mill of, you know, freedom to organize your, 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 your life uh, without undue influence of others. Okay, so in, very, in a very kind of simple, ordinary language sense. Okay, you see that from our perspective, or John Locke's perspective, or John Stuart Mill's perspective, there's not much liberty uh, in China. You know, big brother, big brother is watching you. There might be other things that you like, like economic growth for the last 40 years, but there's not much liberty. But what's interesting about a society like Yemen is that there's not much liberty either, okay? It's for extremely different reasons from uh, China, and I think that's one thing that Daron and I 
we really grappled with in thinking about this. You know, like in some sense, if you're thinking about economic development, poor countries all kind of fail in the same way. But once you start thinking about other things like liberty, you see, well, that's actually not true. You know, the way that liberty fails to exist in China is actually radically different from the Central African Republic or Haiti or, or, or Yemen. So we need a way of thinking about that. We need a theory that allows us to, to think about that. And I think that's one of the contributions of what we're trying to do. And the interesting thing about Yemen is there's actually different ways that liberty fails. You know, one way is something that John Locke would have understood very well, you know, or Hobbes would have understood even better. Without a state, there's a lot of violence and disorder. You know, those knives and the guns and the clans, in most history books of Yemen spend a lot of time talking about feuding and, and violence. Okay, so that's a very Hobbesian type of failure of liberty. But that's not the only thing you see. And that's another theme of the book, which is that in many societies like, which are like Yemen, what you see is a development of norms which try to limit the extent of disputes or delimit the potential for conflict and violence. And, and, and so, for example, in Yemen, Yemen has the lowest rate of female labor force participation in the world. There's enormous restrictions on what people can do, women in that case. And that's also something you see in many of these societies. So that's, a, again, that's a very different challenge to liberty than Hobbes thought about or that China thought about. So the idea is that, but so where does liberty come from? Well, it comes from this balance between the state and society. It comes from, it's a, I keep, <laughs> it comes from the, the Chicago Council of Global Affairs. No, it, 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 it's this narrow corridor. So the title of the book, The Narrow Corridor, now you see where that comes from. It's, you know, it's this, it's this, it's this corridor in between where this balance appears, okay? And I'm, you know, I'm talking about this very historical stuff, and you know, if you've read Why Nations Fail, you'll know, you'll know to expect a lot of historical argument. But one thing that I, I like a lot, I think both of us like a lot about this book relative to Why Nations Fail, is that this gives us a much nicer way of emphasizing like the process. You know, this takes time. And the balance between state and society, it's not some kind of engineering problem. Okay, it's not that, you know, you get James Madison and Hamilton, you know, in, in a room in Philadelphia and they come up with some blueprint and that's it. You know, we all go home and just enjoy the benefits, you know, just kind of press the go button. No, no, this is a very contested thing. Okay, so the way we try to think about that is that this is not an engineering problem. It's a kind of equilibrium. There's a, there's a contest between between state and society, that the state wants to control society and society wants to get the state under control or, or hem it in. Or so so, so, so the, it's a dynamic process, it, this, this, this attainment of liberty, if you like. Or here, you know, I haven't talked about this, but I did mention Hobbes. So we have a very Hobbesian notion you know, we have a very Hobbesian terminology, shall I say, in talking about these different combinations, which we hope will stick in your mind. You know, China, despotic Leviathan. Lebanon, Yemen, let's say, absent Leviathan. And then what we see emerging in this narrow corridor is what we call the shackled Leviathan. Okay, so, so, so let me shut up by kind of making one final point. If that, is that good? Am I on time? Okay, one final point, which is, okay, fine. So, so what's, what's the implications? I think we think there's lots of implications of this, but here's one implication. You know, it's 30 years, more or less, since the Berlin Wall uh, collapsed and the tanks were rolling in Tiananmen Square. And at the time, you know, there was a famous prediction by Francis Fukuyama about the sort of convergence of societies, maybe not the actual convergence of societies to liberal democracy, but the hegemony of some idea that liberal democracy was the only kind of legitimate set of political institutions. Okay? So, so but that's, that, that's a very unlikely thing to happen, according to this way of thinking about the world. You know, if you think about these equilibria in Yemen or China, that's a, that's a very ancient, it's a very deeply rooted in society. It's there because there's lots of mechanisms that sustain it. 
those mechanisms are pretty obvious in the Chinese case. They're, 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 they're equally as obvious in the, Yemen, in the case of Yemen and those societies like that, but I won't, but I won't start talking about them. You can ask. Okay. And, and, and so, so, so this is, you know, to me and to Daron, you know, the way we kind of think about history or we think about the world, you know, doing research in the world, it's this diversity that strikes us as being, it's diversity in the world today. And diversity is the divergence is the pattern kind of historically. So, so, so that's just a snippet of, you know, what this may help you think about and, and hopefully other things too. So let me, with that, I'll shut up. Okay, good. I'm going to sit here. What's going on? You can hold on. I'm going to sit just here. Just right here. Yeah. Okay, great. That's great. Thank you. Well, it's fascinating. Thank you. It's a fascinating book. Um, two quick questions from right. when I was reading. Um, one, you make the very important... First, I think we better explain to the non-poly sci majors what a Leviathan is. Oh, but, um, okay. Just quickly, in one sentence. I've never been sure whether that was, <laughs> was a fortunate terminology. No, no, I think, yeah. I think people will recognize it, but, but maybe it will be good to review. But you, you, you make the point in the book, which I think is, is important, that a shackled Leviathan is not necessarily a small Leviathan, that sometimes a government that is too small can be just as detrimental to people's liberty as a government that is overly powerful without a, without a, a, a balancing force somehow. So. Yes, absolutely. So, you know, Leviathan was just this, it's a sea monster in the book of Job that Thomas Hobbes uh, sort of, you know, used as a metaphor for the, a powerful state, okay? Uh, so so that's, that's where that Leviathan comes from. I, it, I'm, I've always been concerned it's a bit obscured. It's a bit obscured. It, it's perfectly clear in the book. I just wanted to be yeah, sure people understood. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, that's probably why it's not in the title. <laughs> uh, uh, so, so, yeah, I mean, exactly. I think, I think if you look across the world, you know, if you look around the world, it's, it's places with large, <laughs> large governments that, that actually have far more, you know, far more economic development and actually have far more liberty, you know, uh, it's places, you know, many places where I work, you know, like Haiti or the Democratic Republic of Congo that have very small states, you know, tax revenues percentage of national income in Haiti is less than 10%, you know, but that doesn't create liberty, it just creates a massive failure of public good provision and, 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 and order and, and many other things, you know, so, so, so yes, it's not, it's absolutely, so, so shackled Leviathans, shackled Leviathans are big, but the trick to getting there is, 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 is creating confidence in the population, in society, that this thing can be controlled. Right. So actually, that kind of is a good segue to the other question I had as I, as I read the book. You talk about the 1930s, and, and you note that you know, the private sector or the when the people who controlled the means of production, however you want to refer to it, had grown so much and the government could not kind of keep up and balance what was going on in the private sector. And so the government needed new programs, which became the New Deal in this country. Um, and then, but then you say, but, and it was society that demanded the government do something, which was that balancing act. My question for you is, if, if you had asked a wobbly who was marching down Fullerton Parkway in 1935 or a farmer who had kidnapped a judge in Iowa, what do you want? They would have just said, I don't know, I'm angry, right? Fix the banks. So maybe we were lucky that a government came in and said, oh, we need this kind of banking policy. We need, we need these kind of labor policies. We need to do X and Y. But wouldn't it have been just as easy, as happened in other countries, for a government to come in and, and say, we know you're angry. We have the answer. Let's, you know, take care of this ethnic group. Get rid of this ethnic group. So, 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 how does society make sure, which is not that yeah. economically sophisticated, how does society choose leaders who will make the right decisions? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's always a messy process. You know, I think democracy is always a messy process. But the important thing is just to have deliberation and just you know let arguments come out, let people make arguments, think about people's arguments. You know, I always give the example when I'm teaching of the of, of the first, of Britain in the First World War. You know, when the First World War started, German, democracy in Germany basically collapsed and Hindenburg and Ludendorff just took over and it became a kind of militarized state. And for a while the Germans really looked like they were winning. You know, they defeated the Russians, you know, everything. And in England, it was the trade unions were on strike 
strike, you know, when the factories closed down and the people, the, the Labour Party was trying to negotiate this and that to get, you know, and it was like, forget that. We need a dictatorship. Look at the Germans, you know. But what's interesting, if you look at the history, is that that messy process allowed information to come out. It allowed different opinions to come on the table. Hindendorf and Ludendorff, they had, their, they had their plan and they stuck to the plan and the plan didn't work and they wouldn't listen and they stuck to the plan. In Britain, the plan changed. You know, the plan adapted, the plan... And I think that's what democracy is like. You know, I think it's just, it's a mess, you know, but, but this, people complain, you know. People, like, I mean, my view of Brexit, I'm English, you know, so my, I think my view of Brexit is that the referendum was a great idea. You know, look, there's all of this discontent in society, and the British political elite had no idea it existed, you know. And, yeah, it's hard to deal with, because they hadn't anticipated it, and they didn't really get it, and... But it's great that it's out in the open. You have to deal with stuff like that. You can't just repress it. So, so, and I think you've seen the same thing in the US, honestly. You know, I mean, it's, again, it's pretty painful. But, 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 but so I don't think there's a formula. I just think you know, what, what you see is that kind of more accountable, representative institutions do a much better job of dealing with, of adapting, of coping with shocks, of figuring out how to come up with solutions and ideas and you put them on the table and you debate and, and, and uh, I think that's, that's my reading of the evidence. But, but, the, but it, it looked, uh, looked at in detail, it doesn't look very pretty. At the, at the time, at any rate, is I think. And we're living through that moment, yes. Yes, we, so, we definitely yeah. are. Um, so you, you talk a little bit about how the Constitution is a little bit problematic in the U.S. for guarding liberty. I mean, you have some yeah. very interesting sections. You talk about Ferguson, and um, you talk about a, a really interesting history of, of housing policy in the U.S. So explain a little bit about what yeah. you mean about the, the, the reasons the Constitution is sometimes anti-liberty in the yeah, U.S. Yeah, I think, I think, you know, if you think about the way we try to tell the story of the Constitution is that, you know, after the U.S. gained its independence, uh, it wrote this Articles of Confederation, which was very, the state was very weak. There wasn't a national tax system, there wasn't a national monetary system or fiscal system, it was very decentralized to the states. And then, you know, that didn't, that didn't work so well. You know, for many, there were, you know, there were very different interpretations of it, but one interpretation of the problems was there was populism. You know, Massachusetts started printing its own money and the farmers wanted their debts forgiven. And, you know, and who's gonna pay back all this money that we borrowed during the wars? So, so the Constitution was, was a, it was a sort of state-building enterprise. Let's have a strong president, let's have a national monetary system and a national customs, and, you know, and it, but lots of people were worried about that. Lots of people were worried about, you know, and that's, you know, but it came out of Philadelphia, you know, without all these rights, without the Bill of Rights, or, you know, it, and that came later. It came later because there was a struggle, you know, because, you know, Madison had to basically propose, okay, let's have this Bill of Rights, you know, just to get himself elected to the first Congress. So, so there's, you know, we try to say, look, this, this is a, you know, this is a struggle between state and elites trying to make the state stronger to kind of put the genie back in the bottle, but people pushing back against that. But even that was very imperfect. You know, we know, you know, many of those imperfections are well known, you know, the way that slaves were kind of counted in the Constitution in the apportionment for the House of Representatives, but also the Bill of Rights, you know, the Bill of Rights, which was kind of came out of the struggle, it came out of the struggle, but it was it applied to federal, the federal government, not state government. So that allowed for all sorts of abuses of power at the local level that you could say lasted until you know the Warren Court in the 1950s and 1960s. So 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 so. But I guess I'm you know I'm the way I, whenever I think about the U.S. You know I've worked a lot in Latin America, and I always think, okay, so. You know, the U.S. is very different from Sweden, you know, because it had to solve a very different historical problem. You know, there were different interests, different con contests. It had to find a way of kind of controlling this vast territory and a kind of institutional structure that would, that would work. And when you compare that to, you know, the Colombians had to solve that problem, the Peruvians, and, you know, when I think like that, I think there's lots of imperfections in the way the U.S. did this, and I guess our chapter about the US kind of tends to emphasize a lot of these imperfections. 
But you know, if you think about the Latin American perspective, that's chapter 11. <laughs> The U.S. did a pretty good job, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 but it's not just the genius of the founding fathers. It's much more the struggle. That's what we, we try to emphasize. You know, coming right through to the civil rights or the populists or the civil rights or the 1930s you were emphasizing. Yeah. Uh, so did I answer the question? Yeah, I, partially. <laughs> but I, I guess, you know, we've, we've had some discussions here and in other groups about whether the 18th century constitution is going to work. Oh, um, I mean, yeah. So, especially, I don't think the forefathers could have imagined the difference between the smallest state in the U.S. and the largest state in the U.S. being the order of magnitude that you have between Wyoming and California now, right. for instance. And so, as I read as yeah. I read your book, you talked a lot about how certain states and certain parts of the country are able to hold the federal government almost hostage as it makes policies, right? In part because of power in the Senate or other areas. So, Yeah, I mean, I think there's lots of trade-offs. You know, it's actually very interesting. If you read um, James Madison's notes on the Constitution, uh, at some point in the Constitution, the small states, you know, like Rhode Island, no, Rhode Island wasn't there, Delaware, it's Delaware, they start complaining, oh, we're going to be dominated. You know, yeah. you can't have, in, under the Articles of Confederation, each state had the same representation. Mm -hmm. But what they were proposing, what Madison was proposing, is that representation based on population. So suddenly the small states look like, oh, we're going to have no influence over this, you know? And then Madison comes along and says, you know, that's not really the issue. You know, the real issue is like slave states versus non-slave states. So suddenly, like, he just kind of, the whole discussion moves, I mean, it's one of those things that's kind of fascinating for a political scientist. You know, the whole discussion is like, yeah, you know, that's right. That is the problem here. You know, that's the thing we have to try to figure out. And I don't know if just Madison was a sort of political genius that he managed to just like make that issue very salient to kind of move the debate away from this small state versus big state issue, you know. So it was kind of sidelined, you know, in some sense. And, 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 in, and, and, you know, and there was a compromise. You know, there was the two senators so that Delaware got two senators, even right. if it didn't get much representation, you know. But, I, you know, I do think that, so there were compromises and there were trade-offs. And, yeah, I think, you know, you, you, you should always rethink your, your institutions, you know. I mean, I think, I mean, I guess if I went to the Latin American case, though, I'd sort of say, you know, what's remarkable about the contrast between North America and Latin America is the extent to which Latin Americans have sort of always imagined that you could solve your problems by endlessly rewriting the Constitution. You know, that's, that, that, so one can think of kind of examples of relative successes. I think like the Colombian Constitution in 1991, for example, was, was it's a little bit chaotic, but on balance, it's been a very good thing for Colombia. But the big picture, of course, is that hasn't been successful, that somehow in the US, this, this kind of adaptation, you know, albeit with some very archaic uh, aspects to the Constitution that seem very odd, you know, like the Electoral College from a kind of modern perspective. It, at the time, it made sense, but the world has changed a lot. Uh, I guess the usual way that a political scientist would think about that is that, you know, it's very hard to kind of selectively change things. Again, that has happened, of course, with amendments. Mm -hmm. And, you know, perhaps that's something that could be amended, you know, although it's so politically central. Uh, but, you know, generally, you know, the sense in political science is that it's, it's very hard to rewrite constitutions because you can't control what issue right. will appear. You know, if we, once we sit down and we decide to rewrite the rules of our society, it's kind of like anything is possible. And, and, and you know, anything and everything, and sometimes that's not such a great thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, quickly, before we go to audience yeah. questions, um, Hong Kong demonstrations, yeah. which seem to run counter of the description of China that you, that you talked about in Ooh. your talk, um, in that the people are trying to be powerful, although they may not be able to be powerful. Yeah. So why don't you tell us what no, your take on the Hong Kong No, no, I, I, think, I, think, I think Hong Kong is great for us, you know, in the sense that what I think the Hong Kong shows is that, so we're not saying that Chinese people don't care about liberty. Right. We're saying that it's, it, they can't get it. Yes. You know? so, so I would say, and, and the main counter argument to that that many scholars would make, you know, particularly many study, scholars who study China, is that Chinese people, you know, it's a different, 
it's culturally different that liberty is some kind of Western invention and it's just not relevant for thinking about what Chinese people want. But I think that's, you know, the, the, you know people in Hong Kong, I mean, Hong Kong is very culturally Chinese, but, but, but people, what are people fighting for? You know, this is a very prosperous place. They're not complaining about the economy. They're complaining about Big Brother, basically, and, and their freedoms being eroded and potentially extinguished. So, so I think it's absolutely fabulous mm. for us, from the, you know, if you interpret it like that. I'm not complaining at all, and I just, <laughs> I just hope that they are successful. Yes, um, well, that's another issue, yeah. So... Why don't we go to questions in the audience? And I think we've hit a few of these questions that have been sent in. Um, yes, right here. Wait. Hello. My question is around equilibrium. You mentioned equilibrium. And within the corridor, there might be um, states that are in a stable equilibrium. What is your prediction about unstable equilibrium? So the case of Hong Kong, is that a stable or unstable? And what is your prediction about which side is winning? Mm. Are there many states that are going to stay in the corridor, or it's going to diverge into and blow up? Mm. Yeah. Should I? Do we accumulate questions, or should oh, I? Why don't you answer that one? Okay. We usually do one. So that's a great question. So I would say, you know, the way we think about this is obviously that diagram and my 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 presentation is meant to emphasize these sort of historical continuities, you know, uh, uh, but there's a lot of variation that that narrative ignores, you know, so let's just pick, since I talked about the Germanic tribes, let me pick Germany, you know, so, so you know, if I thought about Germany historically, you know, you can see several clear instances where Germany kind of gets knocked out of the corridor. The Thirty Years' War, what does the Thirty Years' War do? It precipitates this kind of absolutist state building, you know, it crashes and burns in 1806, you know. Think about the collapse of the Weimar Republic. You know, the Weimar Republic for 15 years, you know, the Nazi state. Again, that sort of, you could say, what I find interesting about the German case, though, is, and I guess this is why we emphasize persistence a lot, is what I find remarkable about that is the extent to which, once you're in the corridor, some consensus emerges in society about this is how we do things, you know? So, so what I find interesting is that, you know, 1806, the Prussians are defeated at Jena. All of the institutions, like these estates and everything that had been kind of in mothballs, they bounce back and are legitimate, you know? Same thing after 1945. You know, 1945, the Nazi state collapses. What happens? The Germans get together and there's they understand how to do things. You know, there's some consensus in society about what legitimate authority looks like. So I would, so the way we think about this is that, so there is, there's a very kind of low frequency path dependence here, or, you know, once you're in the corridor, some notion of how we do things and how we reach an equilibrium gels, but that can be knocked out by, by economic crises, by all sorts of things. So, you know, so, so, so many people, you know, so many people, so I think that's, and, and that's terribly consequential, of course. You know, the, the Nazi state might have only lasted 15 years, but it, it imposed staggering uh, misery on millions of people. And, you know, so, so, so that's, so the, to emphasize these long historical continuities is not to say, not to be complacent about, about, you know, oh, it's okay, you know, we have populism today, don't worry, you know, in 20 or 30 years time, everything will have sorted itself out, you know, but, but I'm a, I, you know, I'm a social scientist, and I, I like these big picture continuities. But, you know, depending, you know, if we're engaging on a different question, then, then we need to worry about these shocks and how to respond to them and how to maintain this balance between, between state and, and, and society. So, so, so that's how I think about it. Okay. This gentleman right here. So when you were talking about the, when you were talking about Brexit, in what part of this so-called corridor, would you say we end up getting either that result or someone like Trump? Thank you. 
Yeah. <laughs> I don't think Brexit, you know, I don't think Brexit is a challenge to, fundamental challenge to British institutions. You know, even Boris Johnson is behaving himself. You know, so I honestly don't think, I think Brexit, like speaking personally, I think Brexit is a terrible thing, but I don't see it as a kind of fundamental challenge to, to the institutions, you know, honestly. And, 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 you know, my view on President Trump is, you know, again, you know, it's not a, you know, it's not some plague, you know, it, it, you know, it's not, it's, it's, it's not a biblical plague kind of, you know, it's, it's, Inequality, it's marginalization, it's, you know, it's the, the economic fallout from China. I think there's many structural problems in this country that, that people haven't paid attention to for a long time. They've accumulated and accumulated and accumulated, and it's a wake-up call to deal, to deal with these problems, you know? And like the 1930s, and, and so, so, so I, you know, I, I guess I still tend to see maybe it's compared to other parts of the world I do research in, you know, I do tend to see the functionality of U.S. institutions. Of course, President Trump doesn't care about institutions. You know, he has a very personalized kind of way of doing everything, and, but he's hemmed in by, by lots of things. So, 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 so I guess I'm still relatively optimistic that the U.S. will survive this. You know, in, in why, this is you know, not so much the focus of the new book. But in Why Nations Fail, you know, we do look at some historical instances. President Roosevelt, you know, like nowadays, we just remember the good things about President Roosevelt. And perhaps we forget that he egregiously violated term limits and tried to pack the Supreme Court. You know, that, that, wasn't, that wasn't so great. So let's hope in the future we'll be selectively remembering all the good things President Trump did. Yeah. I'm, I'm, <laughs> making a, I'm, I'm making a list. Oh, my goodness. Are, how, one of the students, do any of the students, this gentleman has his hand up. So you mentioned a lot about the interplay between government and society, but what do you think of the role of religion in the evolution of mm. freedom and capitalism and just as an intermediary between the government and society as a whole? Interesting question. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's a good question. I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, I think, you know, one of the problems with for somebody like me who was trained as an economist, you know, that's, you know, is that economics is a sort of very materialistic, you know, it's all about like money <laughs> and, and income. And so I think Daron and I, you know, I mean, I became a political scientist and, and so we, but we, I think we still have this like, like hangover of kind of thinking in this very materialistic way. The way we get into this a little bit in the book, for example, is, you know, we have this discussion of, you know, the, the origins of Islam and Muhammad and, you know, the kind of, the, the, the strategy of political institutions that went along with the rise of Islam. You know, he was a state builder, you know, Muhammad. He was an institution builder, you know, and, and so, but I still think probably if you ask my honest view, you know, we still, we don't really have a good way of thinking about how religion affects institutions. And, and you know, I, let me give you a, an example which I, f I find absolutely fascinating. So I was in Washington recently, and I had coffee with uh, somebody who has been part of the US negotiating team with the Taliban in Doha. So I asked him, you know, like, what's, what's the notion of legitimate political authority that the Taliban have? You know, like, what's, how do they think about the state? And the answer is obvious, right? It's a theocracy. You know, the state is run by imams and, and, you know, and then if I put my social scientist hat on, you know, I think, like, we have no way of thinking about that in political economy. You know, we have mathematical models, we have, you know, we have no way of thinking about how you could ever have a theocracy. It doesn't make any sense, okay? So, so that just shows, you know, the lacuna you know, in many aspects of social science, you know, and that's great for young people like you because there's just so much to do, you know. So I, I think everyone, we're all imprisoned in our kind of, you know, our, with our intellectual concepts and heritage and we try to understand the world and develop ways of thinking about it. And there's always things that escape you. And I honestly think religion is probably something that Daron and I have never kind of been able to fit into our theories too well, but, but, but we're thinking about it, yeah. Interesting question, thank you. Very interesting. This lady right here. 
How commonplace do you think the stable Leviathan has been over recorded history? Mm. And, um, and to what do you ascribe the current relative stability of the stable Leviathans? Mm. You mean this shackled, Le shackled Leviathan when you have this balance of power? Yes. Yeah. I, so so I, I don't think it's so novel, in, you know, and, and, you know so, so we give some historical examples for, you know, like when we talk about this narrow corridor in detail, we talk about Athens, you know, and the, and the constitution and political development of Athens and how that's trying to find this balance between state and society. And if you read Aristotle's Constitution of the Athenians, he describes, you know, how, so that's, a, that's a, you know, that lasted for a long time. And to us, it's the same forces. Uh, a very good friend of mine who's, an, uh, who's a curator in the Field Museum here in Chicago, Gary Feynman, is a, is a scholar of the, the Zapotec, uh, the history of the Zapotecs in the Oaxaca Valley. And he would describe the history of the Zapotec state in a very similar way, I discovered. You know, this balance between state and society. This is not like the Maya. Again, there's a lot of variation. So, I, you know, when I look at this, I find many, hist I don't think this is something modern. You know, I think if you look, if you know, if you read Aristotle's discussion, what people are trying to do and what they're trying to achieve and the instruments, it's very modern to me, you know, and, and, and I, you know, so, so, so I, you know, I guess, you know, again, one could criticize this, <laughs> like one could criticize the notion of liberty, you know, but again, I see what were, you know, what was Solon trying to do or what was Cleisthenes trying to do? They were trying to find a balance, you know, they were, you know, people cared about, yeah, they cared about liberty, they wanted to kick the Spartans out or, or, so I, you know, maybe this is just kind of selectively reading this through my modern mind, you know, but I guess our view is there's a lot of similarities in observed history between humans and the problems they're trying to solve. So if you read the preface, for example, let me just end with the, you know, the, you know, like the, 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 the pref, I should have started with the preface. In the preface, you know, what's the old, you know, what's the oldest written, you know, book that we have? The Epic of Gilgamesh, okay, Uruk, you know, over 4,000 years ago. Same problem, same problems occur, same problems of how to create authority, how to control it, what mechanisms to use, you know. So, so we call this the Gilgamesh problem in the book. So I, yeah, I don't think this is particularly modern. You see many examples of these shackled Leviathans in world history, and they get, you know, they get wiped out, you know, because of some shock or crisis or the Spanish, you know, invade and they conquer Mexico and then you're just like outnumbered and outgunned and, you know, your institutions crash. So, so you know. Kind of an interesting question here. What is the connection between why nations fail and the narrow corridor? Yeah, so I, so here's the connection, good question. I think, you know, why nations fail, we tried to write that, we tried to sort of talk systematically about economic performance, variation economic performance, how that was tied to economic institutions, but how economic institutions emerge out of a political process, okay? So, so I think we did a much worse, I think we did a reasonable job at that. <laughs> we did a much worse job at explaining this massive variation in political institutions you see in the world. There's snippets and bits and pieces. So I think the way to think about, the way to think about this book relative to why nations fail is it's kind of sitting underneath why nations fail. And it's trying to explain really, you know, where all this variation in political institutions came from. In Why Nations Fail, we tried to talk, we talked much more about the consequences of political institutions for economic performance. We have some hints on that, but as I said earlier, we didn't really have the right framework for thinking about this, you know, and, 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 and so, 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 and we, we understood that, but you have to stop at some point. So, so I think it is, if you think of it like that, you know, I think you'll get it when you start reading it. Okay, thank you. Another question? Um, we'll get this young lady and then this gentleman. 
Um, given your e emphasis on persistence and these like long historical patterns, do you think that there is a possibility for one of these, like a Yemen or a China, to move into the corridor in like a long-term, consistent way in the future? I think it's possible. I think Japan is very interesting. You know, uh, I think Japan. You know, if you thought about uh, Japan and the kind of institutional dynamics that emerged in Japan after the Meiji Restoration in the 19th century. And, you know, so how would I think about, you know, Meiji, how would I think about, you know, pre-Meiji Japan? I mean, it was a very weak state. There wasn't really a centralized state at all. There was no fiscal system. You know, it was the tax even at the local level was kind of in kind, not monetized, you know. So it, 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 it has a feeling of, you know, weak state, weak society sort of thing, you know. So, the, you know, in academia, everything comes in three, you know, like three. I mean, you must have, you, know, you haven't noticed that? Like, there's three reasons why Rome declined and mm -hmm. three reasons, you know, for Brexit. And so, so there's three states, right? There's the despotic Leviathan, the absent Leviathan, the shackled Leviathan. Actually, there's a fourth one in the book, which I didn't mention, mm -hmm. which we call a paper leviathan, you know, with homage to Mao Zedong, mm -hmm. the paper leviathan, where, where, you know, it seems like in reality you can get kind of stuck, you know, at this, you can get stuck with a weak state and a weak society. So I think there's different mechanisms that do that. And, you know, many places in the post-colonial world, you know, if I was going to talk about Colombia or something, that's how I think about Colombia. You know, in Colombia, you know, it's, it's not a despotic state, but it's also not like Yemen either. You know, society is not organized in that way or collectively powerful or assertive. So, 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 so I think that's a case, you know, Japan, maybe that's like that in the middle but of the I, I have century. to say, I mean, Japan does not have the huge number of religions that China has, the yeah. huge number of yeah. languages, yeah. the, you know, sure. I mean, the history of a war that killed yeah. 22 million people or whatever that, you know, I mean, it's just, it, and I was referring to the um, Taiping Rebellion, by the way, in the 1860s. Right. But, uh, you know, I, I, I just, so, I, I, it's hard to picture a country yeah. of that many nationalities and ethnicities right. crossing but, into the court. But just, you know, like, right. But, you know, the reason I started emphasizing that is to sort of say it's actually extremely different from China. You know, that, that you don't have this long history of the imperial state. Yeah. And, you know, so, so, so the initial conditions in the middle of the 19th century, right. that's why I started okay, saying okay, So gotcha. yeah, I agree with you completely, okay. but, but, but that's why I started there. So, so you can think of, you know, this was actually a much better place to be in, you know, for getting yeah. into the corridor, even though it was a very traumatic, you know, it was a traumatic thing yeah. to find that to find that balance, you know, in some sense between state and society in, 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 in Japan. And they had a very kind of consultative society in that, you know, getting along was extremely important in Japanese society. Right. Um, I promised somebody over here yeah. one question. Can you talk like super fast? Because we have- Yeah, so um, you talk about the th three kinds of states. I'm curious what you think about uh, how they might come together in a sort of global climate problem like climate change, um, considering I, I have a hard time understanding the solution within the corridor, but you're talking about like outside of that. So how, how, do, you, how do we work on a global problem on a, well, when there's so many different kinds of states? Between these three kinds of states. Yeah, that's a good question. So how does a country like the U.S. or Britain deal with a country like China when you're talking about an issue like global warming? Yeah. Is that, well, is that, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. yeah. I'm not, you know, I'm not sure. I mean, I think... I'm not sure, you know, the book is not about that, and I'm not sure the book has an explanation for that. I think, you know, it's obvious that, you know, as human beings, we're now challenged with these massive global threats that are like far beyond, you know, one economy or one society. And, and somehow we have to, co you know, we have to cooperate and we have to coordinate on a world level. And that's, you know, we have a pretty bad track record of that, you know, as human societies and, and maybe, all of this diversity I'm talking about makes that complicated. But honestly, I, I don't have anything very intelligent to say about that. I think, I think that's obviously a very complicated political problem. And, and I'm, I'm not sure the book has much to say about that. So don't, if you think it's going to answer that problem, don't buy a copy. But, yeah. 
But the interesting. But I, I don't want to be. Yeah. I don't want to be saying for one second that I don't think that is a massive problem. But, it, it is. Yeah. But the interesting thing with China was about ten years ago when they started seeing a lot of unrest and complaining yeah. online and other places about children having emphysema, children having asthma. Yeah. They decided they needed to do something about yeah. the air quality and yeah. put massive amounts of money into electric vehicles and all sorts of other things. Well, so that was an example of a society pushing back a little bit. Yeah, but government. it's a bit, you know, it's a bit like the example of the polders, you know, in the Netherlands. It, 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 if the dikes collapse, the rich people die along with the poor people <laughs> and the right. elites die, you know, so like elites, you know. They want to, well, the Chinese want to stay in power and if they the want to stay in power, yeah, you clean up the air. Like in some sense, you can't, yeah. it, you could be, you know, an elite, but you can't insulate yourself from, from pollution and, you know, like that. So then, I mean, Jared Diamond has a nice discussion of this yeah. in his book, Collapse, you know, right. that some threats, you can't, you know, you can't build a fence or you know you can't build a fence around your house or hire bodyguards or you know kind of privatize this you're just stuck with the problem and you have to do something and i i agree you know the the chinese government has you know has 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 you know they've made much more progress than the indian government for example That's, and which so is interesting. You know, this is a case where you know uh where you know the nature of the problem, in some sense, forces the Communist Party to act in something like the national interest, you know, which is not the usual situation. Interesting. Thank you for a fascinating conversation. If any of you are interested in the book, it is for sale over here to your right. And you're staying around a while, I guess, to sign Absolutely, some copies. Absolutely, yes. Fabulous. I've got my pen. So, thank you very much. <laughs>